Hello everyone, SimCFI here, and in this video we are going to cover all the details on the approach plates. And we'll be using uh, just the, what they call the government ones. Uh, we're not going to use Jeppesen because you usually have to pay for that stuff, and I don't use Jeppesen charts in real life either, so there is that. Um, so starting right at the top here, let's take a look at what this approach plate is. And so as an overview, there's a lot of different sections on the approach plate. So your procedure, the, the procedure ID is right up here at the top. We have ILS or localizer, runway 14. This is for Yuba County Airport, identifiers MYV. And then you have the pilot briefing area, which includes the frequency approach course, these uh, elevations, the note section up here, the approach lighting system, missed approached as a textual, uh, and then it has your frequencies in the order that you would typically have it. So you got to get your weather first, then you'll, you'll be with approach as you're coming in, this is your last approach frequency, and then they switch you over to advisories, the common traffic advisory system frequency. Alright, so then we come down below this big open space in the middle. This is called the plan view. It's an overhead view of the entire approach. It tells you some of the feeder routes that help get you here, procedure turns, a bunch of overhead info. And then we have the profile view down here. This is a side view. So this is showing your vertical profile as you're descending down through the approach. Below this you have your minimum section, which we'll go over more in detail later and then you have your airport diagram, little airport sketch over here. All right, little, little note on, eight, on ATIS, this isn't ATIS, but if you do get ATIS here, um, ATIS is updated whenever official weather is received. Typically that's every hour at the top of the hour, uh, but if they get it at the, at the half hour point, they're gonna update the ATIS. And then if you don't hear the ceiling and visibility, in the ATIS report, then that means the ceiling and visibility are, is greater than 5,000 foot ceiling, greater than 5 mile visibility. And then when, it, um, when we're looking at the plan view here, so this is an ILS or localizer, so the localizer frequency is down here in this box, and that's 110.5, and uh, Here's the identifier, it's LMYV, here's your Morse code identifier. And the, uh, the Morse code is the same as the, uh, the VOR, except for the two dots at the beginning. Now you can tell if a localizer is going to have DME associated with it, if it has a channel at the bottom, like there's a channel at the bottom of uh, the Marysville VOR. Well, there's no channel down here, and so the D, there, there is no DME with this localizer. So the DME that is listed on this approach, on the plan view and the profile view, is DME from MYV, which is the VOR. Okay, so let's take a look at this circle in the top right of the plan view, MSA, MYV, 25 nautical miles. This is the minimum safe altitude or minimum sector altitude for this area, and it's always going to be defined around a navigational aid because you have to know how you, uh, where you are in relation to it. And so these are established based off the bearings inbound. So if you're between the 320 bearing inbound and the 060 bearing inbound, your minimum safe altitude is going to be 2,200 feet. And you can see how that reads around the circle. Now when it comes to uh, identifying points um, in the plan view here, if you when you see this IAF in parentheses, that these are initial approach fixes. And so these are basically the start of the approach. And then we have some intermediate fixes. And then we're going to have a final approach fix indicated by this X down here in the plan view. So when you're coming in uh, with radar vectors or however else you're coming to navigate to the approach, you cannot start descending until you're, you are cleared for the approach and you're established on one of these uh, primary routes inbound. So one primary route inbound, you see it by the uh, heavy black arrows, like we were seeing with those uh, approach and departure procedures, the primary route is the heavy black arrows. So when we're on this, when we pass this initial approach fix and we're established on it, established meaning that localizer needle is, uh, is actually moving inside our gauge, and we're, so we're established on it, we can, uh, we can start descending 
from there coming straight in or if we fly like right if we fly to the VOR and fly outbound on the back course of the localizer then uh, we're going up this we're going this way and we're going to do this procedure turn up here so that's another part because the in the initial approach fix down here is going to be uh, call intersection which is at 5 DME so that's another initial approach fix so you can descend with that too okay so looking at this procedure turn um, you know you're allowed to do a procedure turn when you see this uh, barbed hook here a procedure turn is just a, uh, a means of doing a course reversal so if you are coming in from a southerly direction this approach goes to the south so we have to get turned around first so we come over the VOR and then we're gonna fly we're not gonna fly outbound on the VOR that's not technically correct even though it gets the job done you're gonna be flying outbound uh, from the localizer and the localizer if you are flying the opposite direction the back course then the needle is going to be sensing backwards or you're gonna sense it backwards so if the needle goes to the left you're gonna to have to turn to the right to pull it towards you and you can tell if you're on a back course now if you look at this this feather here uh, this little cone shape going up you got a shaded side and a non shaded side well, when, we're, when we're going straight in to run to one four uh, the shaded side will be on your right hand side and that means you're going the proper direction so the needle will be normal sensing you go towards it to center it just like a VOR so when we're flying outbound, we're going to do we're, we're flying the back course outbound, and uh, you have to get yourself far enough away, but remain within 10 nautical miles, as you see in this plan view, before you, when you start your turn here. So when we do our turn, we're going to make a right turn to a heading of 006, and then typically just fly for about a minute on this leg, and then we'll make a left hand turn and come back in on a heading of 186 and then we will intercept the localizer and proceed inbound on the approach. Uh, the speed limit for doing this procedure turn is going to be 200 knots indicated airspeed. And you cannot start the procedure turn until you are established outbound from uh, the point where it starts. So in this case the initial approach fix at call you cannot start that procedure turn until you get to that point. Okay. Now, not all uh, approaches will have a barbed turn procedure turn like this. So if we go to uh, Castle Airport, the ILS localizer DME, runway 31, we will see that we have this racetrack here. So this is a holding pattern for a uh, procedure turn, basically. So if you're coming in from the north, um, or if you really wanted to, you can just, uh, if you wanted to practice this approach, from this airport you can just take off on 1-3 I think this is yeah take off on 1-3 and climb up to 3,000 feet and go to the VOR and then you just enter this this uh, right hand you can see the arrows indicating these are right hand turns enter this right hand holding pattern and I uh, do like a parallel or teardrop entry which we'll talk about holding patterns in another video but you enter this and you're only expected to do one lap or basically one you know one shot coming inbound once you come in once you get established inbound you don't need to keep going around this ATC only expect you to do it once to get yourself established inbound that's the whole point of it and typically they do this because they don't have enough room to allow you to do that barb turn because this one keeps you within 10 miles this one is uh, just saying you, you're gonna do it right here so and it's a, a one minute holding pattern so what well, you know we'll go over that later too Okay, so uh, I haven't seen it too many places. I had to go find this one. So Lincoln, Nebraska, they have the ILS localizer runway 18, and you have a teardrop course reversal. And so if you zoom into the plan view, this teardrop course reversal starts a little bit off the, the approach course here at the Lincoln Vortac. You fly outbound uh, on the 321 radio. And then once you get to uh, Jusum intersection, which is 12 DME from the Lincoln Vortac, you make your uh, the swinging right hand turn to come intercept the in a, the final approach course. And then lastly, um, 
If you're coming in from an area where you don't have to do a procedure turn, sometimes it'll tell you that too. So right here, if you're coming in from the north, you're at 3,200 feet, uh, no procedure turn, no PT to Asako intersection, which is just later on. So there's no procedure turn necessary to get from here to here. You're just going straight in. Okay, so that's what no PT means, no procedure turn. All right, so let's look at some of the components of an ILS. This is from the Instrument Flying Handbook. It's another free FAA resource. So at the opposite end of the runway, uh, this is your VHF localizer. This is what's actually transmitting the signal. And it's giving you your lateral guidance. And so that, that localizer needle, you know, if you look at these instruments, it's just like your VOR, it's the vertical needle. And you, like I said, when you're not doing the back course, when you're flying proper direction, it senses just like a VOR, but it's gonna be a little bit more sensitive, especially as you get closer to the airport, because you can see that the uh, this feather basically gets tighter and tighter as you come down, so the, the needle gets more sensitive the closer you get to it. Kind of like a, a VOR, it'll get sensitive too. All right, so then you're gonna have a glide slope, and so that's transmitted here from this little box on the left side of the runway, and that's, your, that's the vertical part. So the glide slope on this instrument is the horizontal bar. And if the, if the horizontal bar goes up, you follow it up. If it goes down, you follow it down. And on some instruments, like a HSI, horizontal situation indicator, it'll just be like two little dots or arrows on the side of the instrument that'll move up and down as well, but it's the same principle. Um, and then ILS as well, will sometimes have uh, marker beacons. There's three beacons it can have. There's a there's an inner marker, which would be right over the touchdown zone of the runway pretty much. There'll be a middle marker, which is going, and so the inner marker will flash white and just be uh, a series of uh, dots, Morse code. And then the middle marker is going to flash a blue light and it's going to be a dot dash dot dash and the outer marker, oh no, yeah, the, uh, oh no, the middle marker is orange. Middle marker is orange, it flashes orange, and that's gonna be your dot dash, and then the outer marker is going to be blue, and that's just gonna be a dash dash Morse code. And so that flashes your blue light, your yellow light, and then you have a white light for the inner one, if you have it, they're, they're kind of rare. And so the, the outer marker is typically around your uh, final approach fix, and the middle marker is typically your missed approach point. Okay, so looking at the profile view, again, you know, when, when we have an ILS, you want to know what kind of a descent rate you should set your airplane up for to maintain a nice stabilized approach, because you don't have time to really chase this needle around, or at the very least it's going to make your life very difficult if you don't know what rate of descent you need. So, in the in the profile view, it's going to tell you the angle of the glide slope, and the, typically it's going to be three degrees. Sometimes it's not, and you just have to see the number here. So you need to know the glide slope angle, and you need to know your ground speed. So then you can come to this chart, and there's, there's formulas you can do it too, but if you just come to this chart, um, instrument approach procedure rate of descent table and you look up your angle of descent so three degrees and if you're flying a Cessna 172, 182 you're probably going to fly your approach around 90 knots and you come straight down and you see your rate of descent should be about 480 feet per minute. Now obviously you also need to take into consideration the winds as well. Alright, so looking at um, at step downs, let's go to the Reading Airport. So the localizer DME back course for runway 16. This is this is a very interesting approach to fly. But we're gonna go look at the profile view here and we'll be looking at, at some of these step down fixes. So DME is required, it says it here, and what any time, what, whatever equipment is listed in the title of the approach, 
is the equipment that you need. So you need localizer and you need DME on the airplane to fly this approach. And so these step-down fixes are identified by DME and they're identified by the the reading localizer, hence the L and the dash in front of the RDD. If it was just RDD with these numbers, it means the DME is coming off of the reading VOR, which is over here. But in this case, it's coming off the localizer over here, and you can see that it, it can do that because you have this channel 24. And, and from the first video, if you remember, I had trouble picking this up, and there was, there was a workaround to fix it. It's in the comments of that video if you want to get it fixed. Um, I think it, the issue is because it was an Orbix airport, and and so the file doesn't get updated. It, it's something weird. And it's also in the A2A forums. There's links to download the file. That'll fix that. So you can get your DME off the localizer here. But anyways, so as you're coming down, when you're just on a localizer, this is a non-precision approach because we have no vertical guidance. So what we're doing is we're coming in we fly a DME arc first of all. That's some, that's a later discussion. Um, well, essentially, what a DME arc is, you're going to get to your initial approach fix on either side here, and you're just going to maintain 17 DME off of the Reading VOR until you get to the localized course, and then you turn it inbound. So, the uh, the intermediate fix here that actually gets you onto the course is. Uh, uh, whiskey. So when we get to whiskey here, we'll be at 15.9 DME off of the Reading localizer, and you see how we switch from the Reading VOR DME to the localizer DME. So we get 15.9 DME. We should be at 5,800 feet, or no lower than 5,800 feet, hence the underline. And then, so once we cross that point, you want to descend down a little bit more rapidly. Anytime you have step down fixes without vertical guidance, you want to be descending a little bit more rapidly than normal so that you don't get too high in the approach. So then we'll go down and stay level at 4,300 feet until we get to Mylar, which is going to be identified by 10.7 DME. Then once we cross that, we step down to 3,000 feet, which is up to 6.5 DME. We take that to. And then this little X here indicates the final approach fix. So this is your final approach fix. You usually want to be configured for landing at or before this point. And you see that it's a 3.46 degree angle down to the ground here. So then once you cross this point, we get to we can descend down to 1,500 feet, uh, which is at 2.5 DME. That's where we're waiting till 2.5 DME. And then we can step down again, and that's where we go down to the minimums down here. So the straight in for runway 16, we can go from 1,500 feet at 2.5 DME to 940 feet, and then we just hold that until we until we get to the missed approach point. And so the missed approach point is going to be identified um, in this example is right here at 0 0.6 DME off of the Reading localizer. Okay, so we're going to come back to that in a second. Um, also in your plan view, if you do have an ILS, the usually the glide slope intercept and the final approach fix are roughly the same spot, but your final approach fix is always that X, but the glide slope intercept is this altitude with the lightning bolt here. That's where your um, your glide slope intercept is going to be since we're still looking at profile view here. So flying the ILS, we do our procedure turn. We're at 3,000 feet. Once you're done with your procedure turn, we can descend down. Once we get past this point, in this case, once we cross the VOR inbound, you descend down to 1,800 feet, and you just wait until the glide slope comes down. And you should, in this case, you should get the glide slope intercept at 1800 feet, right around 6.7 DME, and then you just follow the glide slope all the way down. Okay, so when it comes to, where's that, where's, where's missed approach point? So we'll talk about missed approach point first. So your missed approach point uh, with a, when you have vertical guidance, like on an ILS, when you have the glide slope, the your missed approach point is called the decision altitude or decision height, DA, DH, two ways of doing it. And so 
In this case, if you're doing the ILS, your minimum is 381 feet, so you're constantly descending, and uh, as long as you're on the glide slope, as soon as you hit 381 feet, if you don't see the runway, you go missed. It's as simple as that. If you don't have a glide slope, coming back to this localizer back course approach, then there's a couple ways of doing it. So we said this one is identified by the 0.6 DME. Um, and, and so this is called an MDA, Minimum Descent Altitude, because we're not descending all the time. We just dive down to our minimums, 940, and sit there. Now, at other times, with the, back at Marysville here, the ILS or localizer, if you're not doing this as an ILS, maybe because your, your glide slope feature is broken or the glide slope is inoperative at the airport, you've downgraded to a localizer. So in this case, we come here straight in, localizer 1-4. Our minimum is, is now 560 feet. So after we cross the final approach fix at 1600 feet, we dive down to 560 and wait. What we're waiting for in this example is to, uh, we have to time the approach. And so this is why you want to choose like 60 or 90 knots here for your airplane. And so if you're flying the approach at 90 knots from the final approach fix, to the missed approach point is 4.6 miles at 90 knots ground speed. It should take us 3 minutes and 4 seconds. And so you, you have to start your time at the right time at your final approach fix. And as soon as you get 3 minutes 4 seconds, you're going around. Okay, another example is going to be uh, same airport, the VOR approach. Where did I put that one? Here we go. So, the VOR approach to runway 32 at Marysville, Yuba County. It's extremely simple as you're looking at it. Um, you can get radar vectors in, or you do you go to the VOR, fly outbound, do your procedure turn, come in, and then once you're in, you descend, and uh, you go down to, if you're doing a straight in, you go to 880 feet, you sit there, and your missed approach point is going to be when you cross the VOR. You can see that here, the dashed lines that go back up is your missed approach, and so it's the Marysville VOR DME, that is your missed approach point. Now another way, well, let's see, that's about it. So, when doing a missed approach procedure, it is described textually up here, or it's described graphically here, and you see the little arrow, and you, and you see the little arrow here, the dashed arrow, and this is kind of pointing you to where you need to go. And so in this case, we're climbing straight ahead to 2300 feet on the uh, the 316 radio outbound, which is essentially runway heading. And then we're going to make a, a climbing left turn to 4000 feet and a heading of 230 to intercept the Sacramento 329 radio, and then we're going to hold at Yuba intersection in this holding pattern here. So what happens if you're coming into the approach and maybe for some reason you're not getting your, your gear down three green or some other malfunction and you just want to go missed approach early? So what you need to do is you can start climbing because there's nothing wrong with climbing but you do not want to turn. You don't want to start your turn until you get to the missed approach point. So you can climb straight ahead on the approach course still, and you have to wait till we cross the VOR, or wait till you cross that 0.6 DME, or wait until the time has elapsed on that localizer, and then you can do your missed approach. Because if you turn early out here or out here, there might be obstacles that the FAA has not tested for this approach. Okay, so looking at the, uh, the airport sketch now, We'll look at some of the lighting that you'll see with the airport. So right down here, REIL, this is runway edge identifier lights for runway 14. What these are for 14, it's, it's just two white strobe lights at the end that flash at the same time to help you just find the end of the runway. And then for the whole length of the runway, for the whole runway 1432, we have high intensity runway lights. So it's, it's all the runway lights, your, your runway edge lights, essentially. And you can have medium intensity as well. Okay, now if you look over here, this black circle with the A5, this is telling you the type of approach lighting system you have, and this is a rudimentary uh, graphical depiction of it. You can get more details on 
the lighting systems. Where is that at? Right down here. This is the aeronautical chart user's guide that we talked about before. And so these are all your types of approach lighting systems. So we find A5 and we see that this is medium intensity approach lighting system with runway alignment indicator lights, the Mauser. Same light configuration as SSALR. So this is the lighting configuration. This is your SSALR. This is A3. So it gives you distances, you got white lights, a green bar, sequence flashing lights. So that's the, that's the type of stuff you can uh, expect and this would be high intensity. Alrighty, so, and, and you can read more in detail about the different approach lighting systems. So then looking at some other, uh, uh, yes, so some other lightings if you want to know about Pappy or Vazzy, you look here. So we've got the circle with a V, the circle with a V. So runways 1, 4, and 3, 2 both have a Vazzy. 5, 2, 3 have nothing for your visual uh, vertical guidance. Um, and if it has a Pappy, it'll, it'll just be a P there instead of a V. Remember, uh, the Vazzy is two lights over two lights. The Pappy is the bar of four lights. And they do the same thing. Okay, so now an interesting th thing to talk about is uh, parallel approaches. If you have parallel runways like San Francisco or the ILS or localizer to one left and one right here at Wichita, um, what they're typically going, I just deleted one, what they're typically going to do is, you know, if, if the runways are far enough or if they're not far enough apart you know we don't know all the standards um, but basically they're going to keep you one and a half miles separated diagonally radar distance from other aircraft on parallel approaches and uh, you can tell they're going to do parallel approaches because up here in the notes section we have simultaneous approach authorized with runway one left this is one right now if, uh, if they have the authorization, they can do simultaneous ILS parallel approaches, which means that um, you're, they're going to fly the parallel runways and the aircraft can be next to each other. And so then you're going to get radar advisories from the tower for that. And if the runways are less than 4,300 feet apart, then you can do simultaneous close parallel ILS approaches. And that's when we get into this stuff. So the example here is at Atlanta, and you have ILS PRM runway 9 right. So now we're getting something different up here, whereas the last one we didn't see this PRM. PRM is Precision Runway Monitoring, and it's an extra special hardware piece of equipment, basically. It requires special training on, on the part of the pilot and the controller. Um, and there's some extra details I won't go into. Uh, but basically, they're running parallel approaches extremely close together, and you got multiple controllers monitoring and ready to talk if the pilots are getting off course. Okay, so we won't go much more into that. So now, yeah, we were talking about the back course approaches. Let's go back to this back course here. So, when we're coming inbound on final, you see how the shaded is on the left-hand side. That indicates it's a back course, because normally it's on the right-hand side, so we're going down the back course. And so we talked about how the sensing is backwards. If the needle goes to the right, you got to go left to chase it. But if you have a horizontal situation indicator, or HSI, then all you got to do is dial in the normal inbound course for the localizer, and then it'll read normally. So you tune your HSI, your, your, you dial your HSI course needle to 342, which is the outbound, or, or the normal the normal inbound for this way. So you tune it for the outbound, basically. And so it's going to point down as you come in, but the needle is going to sense normally. So an HSI makes the back course approach really easy. 
two other approach types. Uh, it's actually three. So two more. You're going to you, that are a little bit more rare. You're going to see LDA and SDF. So LDA, you can think of localizer darn angle. What it means, it's a localizer type directional aid, and we say darn angle because the way to remember what this is is the fact that it can be on a weird angle to the runway. Sometimes they'll show it in this sketch down here, but you can see it up here how it's not quite in line with the runway. And so your your LDAs are a localizer type thing and so you get this normal localizer feather but it's just going to be angled off the runway a bit. That's the main difference with that. And and while I was looking at this there's some other stuff I wanted to point out. So sometimes you're going to have different minimums if you can uh, you can get lower minimums if you have um, extra equipment that's not required for the approach. So in this case at skirt intersection um, it's the there's an outer marker here, and it's uh, there's a little ADF, a little NDB down here, and so if you have ADF and you can identify this outer marker, or if you have radar, or if you have DME, so read the 4.9. So you have three different ways of identifying this point, and so if you can identify skirt intersection, then you can descend down to 1720 feet versus if you're doing you know straight in LDA runway 6 straight in LDA runway 6 normally it's going to be 2680 you get down almost a thousand feet lower if you can identify this fix which makes it pretty cool okay and then the SDF stands for simplified directional facility and it's not quite a localizer and so they take away the shading on this feather thing um, and the main difference here is it can, it can still be an angle offset with the runway um, but the main difference is that this can be 6 to 12 degrees wide laterally whereas an LDA and a localizer are going to be approximately 5 degrees wide alrighty so uh, minimums, there is one thing that I did miss and I was thinking about it the whole time. So when, it, when we have our approach category, A, B, C, D, and sometimes there's E, um, it's, it's defined off of 1.3 times your stalling speed in the landing configuration, so 1.3 times VSO, and that's down here, and so if 1.3 times VSO, the result is less than 91 knots, so 90 knots and below, you're going to be category A. And so that's going to be your Cessna 182, 172, stuff like that. Um, if it's between 90, if it's 91 knots to 120 knots, you're going to be category B. 121 to 140 is C. 141 to 160, 165 is D. And anything 166 or more, is going to be category E. And again, it's defined as 1.3 times VSO. And then another thing, when we have circling minimums, we didn't talk about that, you have to maintain certain distances away. So if you're category A, you have to be able to, uh, well, you can go no further than 1.3 miles away from uh, the end of a runway. If you're category B, you can see how this stuff increases with your categories, the ranges you get from the end of the runway. So looking at circling minimums, that's down here, that's the circling. What, the, what that means is you're doing the approach for runway 18, but if you got to land on runway 36 or any one of these other runways because of winds or some other issue, then you have to do, you have to come in and circle. And so they want you to be a little bit higher up and have a little bit more visibility. So you have circling minimums. And so this one's taking you down to 17. Well, it, let's, let's skip this. Uh, so 1780 for your circling. It looks like your straight in localizer is the same actually, but we got 2400 feet runaway visual range versus one statute mile. So it's half the visibility for the localizer, and uh, obviously the ILS brings it down lower. Um, so again, we, we have this extra equipment, so roll rock, fixed minimums. So if you can identify roll rock here, 
So it requires dual VOR receivers because you're doing ILS or localizer, so that's a NAV1. Um, and Rorock is going to be identified by the 195 radio off of the Lincoln Vortac. So you have to have that in NAV2 simultaneously. So if you have two VORs, you can do this. You can get down to these lower minimums. And so that's another thing. Um, actually, so we got so your minimums. This is your your M, your MSL altitude. So your altitude above above mean sea level. So when you're coming in on the ILS, all these all these minimums. This is um, where you go on the altimeter. And then over here is the visibility. Visibility minimums can be reported as statute miles, so like one statute mile, or three quarter statute mile, or one half, or it can be re reported as runway visual range, or RVR. What RVR is, is multiple sensors up and down the runway that shoot uh, beams at each other, and they, they, they measure the, the distance that they can see, basically. And so 2,400 feet is about half, and there's a little table. Here we go. I don't know how I missed this stuff. Okay, so if you if you have to convert RVR to visibility because the RVR system is broken, here's a little table to get you started. But just remember that one statute mile is 5,280, so roughly there. So if you have 2,400, 2,400 RVR, that's going to be half. That'll convert to a half mile visibility. Um, and on these uh, minimums as well. So 1395 on your altimeter is going to be 200 feet above ground level and then the numbers in parentheses are military minimums so you don't have to worry about that. Alright, let's just, let me just check my notes make sure I didn't miss anything else. But I'm pretty sure that is it. There was a lot of info to cover for the approach plates and after this we'll be ready to go fly because we've looked at all the charts basically to take off en route, arrive, and then do the actual approach all the way back down to the runway. And so after this we'll go fly. So this was a nice video. Hopefully uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Leave any comments down below for questions and I'll see you flying later on.